tell me the codes <laughs> to the computer. <laughs> You're really on some thin ice here. You can end this at any time. Any time. <laughs> 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 well, I really thought that was going to be more dramatic. So whether you plan on living or just traveling in a van, when those winter months hit and you're on the road, you need to figure out a way to keep yourself warm. Skeep it. Skeep it good. For those of you who are new to the channel, in my first van, I had a suburban furnace that ran off a 12 gallon propane tank that I used to generate hot air. And I lived in the van for three years, but it didn't take me that long to figure out how quickly you can blow through propane trying to stay warm during the winter months. I usually just kept my thermostat on 55 and then tried to park somewhere where I could plug into shore power so I could run a space heater. That way I still had enough propane to cook and like take hot showers, things like that. So this time around, I wanted to find a different heat source and honestly avoid propane entirely. Now I had been a of hydronic heating systems, but I wasn't really sure how they worked. A hydronic system works by heating fluid, propylene glycol in our case, and distributing the hot liquid via tubing in underfloor systems, and to other components, such as a heat exchanger for our hot water, or an air matrix for hot air. Okay, come on, let's Brief go. Brief intermission. Go on. Rock, come on. Scoot your bet. So we decided to give it a go. We found a D5S hydronic heating kit from a company called Heat Cell, and it would run off of our van's diesel tank as well as our house 12 volt batteries. Now I will point out that this is their older system and they're really starting to put more focus on the D5E, but we were really interested in the high altitude kit, which only comes with the D5S. So if you go with the D5E, it'll only operate properly up to 10,000 feet above sea level, which is probably fine for most people. But since we camp and hike 14ers often above 10,000 feet, the high altitude kit will monitor and regulate our system's pressure so that we can continue to have heating at those higher elevations. So yeah, most of you will probably want to go with the D5E, which is different from us. But the installation of the two are pretty much the same, so what we're going to cover in this video will relate to the D5E. The biggest difference will be in the electrical, which is going to be focused on at the very end of the video. Really quick, this video is going to be decently long, and I just want to say that we're probably going to talk fast and try to squeeze it into the shortest amount of time possible, but if there's something that you'd like to skip to, we're going to be including chapters within the description so you can do that. Okay, now let's get started with the install. So when your kit arrives, you might be feeling overwhelmed by the amount of components in the box, but if you take it step by step, it really isn't that bad. So let's start with all the components you're going to want amount on the exterior of your van, which includes the heater, a little diesel fuel pump, and the glycol slash water mixture pump. Plus all those necessary bits and bobs that come along with the kit so you can mount all that stuff to your van. So the first thing you're going to want to do is download the appropriate installation manual for your system. They include a DVD, but if you're like us and you don't own a DVD player, you can scan the QR code and find it online. So with that in hand, it's time to get started. And the first thing you're gonna wanna do is figure out where you're gonna mount your heater. If you go by the instructions, they show that you can mount it within your engine bay, which we've seen people do. We've seen people mount it toward the front of the van, toward the rear of the van, where the spare tire is, but we chose to put it as close to where we were gonna have all the internal components so we could have a shorter run and not lose a bunch of heat going from the heater than to say the heat exchanger and air matrix and all that stuff. Also, it's important to place it somewhere it's not gonna get bashed with a bunch of debris and say rocks while you're driving. And that's why the engine bay is really safe. It's just completely covered. We decided to put it very close to the rear tire up in this tiny little crevice area where we knew it wasn't really gonna get bashed or beat it around. Beat it. Beat <laughs> it. Now, if we go right about here, the way it says this should be mounted, you could do it vertically or horizontally. And if we do it horizontally, it's gonna be a real tight fit. And getting access to all this stuff will be pretty difficult. It'll be a bit easier if we do it like that. And this way, the plastic side is pretty well protected because this is here. And then this is also kind of protected and we have access right here. We'll probably be popping through right about here. And don't get me wrong, this takes a lot of pre-planning on your layout. In my previous van, I had the plumbing running from one side of the van to the other because I had my shower over here and my sink over here. And when it got cold out, it opened my lines to be able to freeze. This time I made sure to keep all of the plumbing in an accessible location 
under this bench seat right here along with the hydronic system so that I can have shorter lines because shorter lines equal better performance. So our biggest constraints were making sure we didn't hit one of our floor joists and making sure that the lines would come up under our hypothetical couch. So I just took some measurements, held the heater into place, and decided on a location. Now to mount the heater to your van, you're going to need to use the provided bracket. And at first we were a little confused on how it all worked. This mounts to this plate through this hole and then these bottom holes. Bing, bing. And then over here. The bracket can mount to your van using either bolts or screws in a few different holes located on the mounting plate. So once I had it in place, I made sure everything was still accessible and then I traced all along the heater with the bracket there. The Sharpie's killing it. One, two, three, four. In your kit, you'll find several self-tapping screws as well as some M6 bolts. Now self-tappers are like the quick way you can mount your brackets and the different items to your van. In the past, I've had some issues with the self-tappers because I've made mistakes and had to pull them out. And then when you go to put them back in, it's kind of hard. You can't really like re-thread in. You usually have to pop a new hole. So this time around, I wanted to try out some riv nuts. A riv nut is a little nut that can compress down onto a piece of sheet metal like a sandwich, which then leaves you with a threaded hole to screw into as many times as you like. All you need to do is pop the proper fitting that matches the bolt size you have, pre-drill a hole big enough for the fitting, prime it, place the nut within the hole, and squeeze. I think I pulled a muscle on my neck. Okay. That's in there. So I placed four rib nuts into the side of the van, lined the bracket up, and it was perfect. I didn't have to take that bracket off, add another rib nut, widen the holes on the bracket even more to get it to fit. I did a bang up job the first time and didn't make a mess at all. It looks perfect. It always looks perfect. <laughs> And with the heater mocked into place, it was time to decide where our fluid lines were gonna enter the van. Ben just used the heater's exhaust end piece since it was straight and short enough, and he just lined it up and traced around it. Then I snagged a drill bit and popped a little pilot hole through the floor, just to make sure I wasn't gonna hit one of our floor joists or our PEX lines. And once I knew we were in the clear, I grabbed an inch and three eighths hole saw since those glycol lines have about an inch outer diameter. And I wanted enough on each side so that when we did put them through, I could add some sort of gasket or sealant to keep the rubber from rubbing on the van's bare metal. Where are ya? <laughs> and since we popped a new hole into the van, we made sure to prime it with some enamel that we had left over and let it dry. Now on your heater, you're gonna have five connections you're gonna need to make. Two for your in and out on the glycol lines, then you're gonna have an air intake and an exhaust and a little diesel fuel inlet. Since we were working in such a tight space underneath the van, I knew I'd wanna mock everything up outside before I had to get back up under there and then tighten it all down. The kit comes with three quarter inch or 20 millimeter inner diameter tubing that comes with some 90 degree turns in it for the glycol, an air intake line, an exhaust pipe with a muffler, and some itty bitty hoses to connect your diesel lines with. There's also several hose clamps to attach them all with. Now you can utilize the 90 degree turns in the three quarter inch hose, but they also provide you with plastic 90 degree elbows that you can swap in and out on your heater. In order to do that, you pop the plastic cover off with a small torx bit. Then remove the split cog and o-ring to release the straight piece. Then snag your elbow, add the o-ring, put it back in place, put that cog back on, and clip it all back down. Easy peasy. Actually, it was super frustrating, and I can't tell you how many times we had to do it. I made sure to point the heads of the hose clamps in a direction that I'd be able to access once under the van, just in case we needed to troubleshoot anything later on. Once all of our connections were made, we went back under the van to mount it all into place. You gonna sweat flies with this? Score. <laughs> <I'm>... <laughs> Ugh, I need something to do with my fingers. We made sure to use some thread lock on all of our bolts, since it's a van and vans vibrate. Threadlock has a very sweet taste, so I advise you to try it out. This is what's going to help us mount to the bracket. Okay. Let's go keep feeding these up. Now we have to figure out where that bolt is. So slide. Nice and solid. Then it was time to mount our exhaust. Keep in mind, you want to keep it about two and a half feet away from the air intake. 
It came with two brackets, but we ended up using the L-shaped one. Again, I just added a rib nut. Come on! Those are my bones. What do you mean it was your bones? It went... <laughs> I mean, I heard it. Added some thread lock and then popped it into place. We've hose clamped the exhaust here and then it runs out, loops around, connects to our muffler and then runs out this tip. Now it's time to do the air intake. It's recommended to place the intake about two and a half feet away from any exhaust. You also want to make sure not to point the opening towards the front of the van where a bunch of dust and debris can get kicked up into it. Last one for the night. You'll want it slightly angled downward so it can drain any condensation and debris. And if you have a low point, you'll want to pop a drainage hole. There you have it. I'm gonna cut this tag end off, and then you see now we have our intake. It is not into the direct flow. It's shielded by our fuel, our diesel tank, and it's at an angle, so if any crud gets in there, it's angled down. We then hop back into the van to add some caulk to the edge of our lines to be used as a grommet to protect them from rubbing on the metal of the van. We'll let it sit and we'll check it tomorrow from underneath and see if it looks like this tube is touching at any point and then go from there. We've seen multiple people make all sorts of cool bulkheads and impressive contraptions that allow their lines to go from the exterior of the van to the interior. But when we got a hold of heat, so they told us that a lot of it's overkill and we'd probably be fine by just adding a little bit of caulk around the edges. So guess what? We're going with it. We're gonna risk it. Cause that, what's the, you know? <laughs> what's life without risks, okay? It's boring. boring, but you already know that. You right there who's about to write that comment. You know that. All right, at this point, we felt we were on a roll and right on cue, we hit our first roadblock. Was that convincing? What? <laughs> I'll tell you. The next step in our install was to take a line from our diesel tank into a pump that would then feed diesel into our heater. So we mounted the fuel pump, ran a line to our heater, and then when we went to run the line to the diesel tank, we found out... We don't have an auxiliary fuel line. Now most newer sprinters come with an auxiliary fuel line, and I figured since ours was a 2016, there'd be one there. Sometimes they're just left open where you can connect directly to them with one of these. A little quick disconnect. Or if it's in use, you can tap into it using one of these. A quick disconnect T. But we had nothing. So then I thought, well, there's still these quick disconnects that are running through the main fuel line and the return line. Maybe I can pop one of those off and connect to it. And within the instructions, it even says you can connect to the return line. Just make sure not to create any like 90 degree turns within that line. You don't want to like disrupt it. So I thought, cool, I'll still use this T and connect to it. Well, we disconnected them and I went to put it on and of course it didn't fit. The diameter of the fuel lines are a bit larger than the diameter of this fitting. So that idea was shot and I really didn't want to have to tamper with those fuel lines and mess something up. So we just decided to install our own auxiliary line. Now, if you already have an auxiliary fuel line, then great. You can go ahead and skip to the next chapter where we install the pump. But for the rest of you, here's a really quick explanation on what we did. First things first, if you know you're gonna be dropping your fuel tank, you wanna make sure to get out as much of the fuel as you can before doing it. That's why I made sure to top off my tank two days before we did this. I had to siphon out as much fuel as I could. I got a weird siphoning tool, then I tried the two tube blow technique, and I ended up just drinking it out. Still ended up with a mouthful of diesel. Then it was time to disconnect the fill port. It's attached with five or six screws. We had to pop off the little door to get access to the last bolt, and then it was loose. Then you can go under, unscrew the protective shield, pop off the little protective boot to reveal a brown wire that you'll need to disconnect. Go ahead and disconnect it and head over to the fuel lines. You can get a special tool for this or use brute force with a flathead. You can also disconnect a little electric connection. Then. And with that, you're good to drop the tank. But first you're gonna to wanna to jack up the driver's side of the van so that when you do drop the fuel tank, you'll be able to slide it out without having it get stuck. I had a larger jack, but if you don't, you can always use the one that comes with the van located under the passenger's dash. Then you can start removing the six bolts holding the tank to the van. Cheater bar, torque. Oh, 
I hurt my nose. <laughs> well, we got it, it on camera. <laughs> now I've seen several people place boxes underneath their tank to catch it as it falls, but since I still had plenty of fluid left in the tank, I used my small jack with a piece of scrap wood to hold it into place so I could remove the bolts without any pressure and lowering everything at once. With all the bolts removed, we dropped the tank and wiggled it out from underneath the van. So we're out and this is our main connection here. What I'm gonna do is disconnect this uh, electrical line here that runs to the van. Yeah. So we're free and then we've already disconnected these lines. So we'll disconnect them completely out there. Now we're basically good to get this out. We just need to lean it a little bit in order to fish the head of the, the fill line out. One more, one more. Ah. I'm guessing this is our auxiliary line nipple. This is our main focus now. I will say over here, there's a number 545 right there and there's an arrow. So when we go to tighten this back down, we wanna match that arrow up to that number in that line. Then you can pop your fuel lines, but make sure to keep track of how they're on there. Oops. Filling diesel out I know, everywhere. I could drink that. Removing the lid is a bit of a pain. I used a chisel with a hammer and very delicately worked it off until I can just use my hands to get it the rest of the way. Then I removed the fuel line housing, being very cautious of the fuel lines, float, and O-ring. Yeah, I spilled diesel everywhere. Then it's on to installing your auxiliary fuel lines. You'll find a nipple with nothing attached to it. So snag yourself about nine inches of quarter inch hose, attach it to the bottom nipple with a hose clamp, and this is how you'll be getting the fuel from the tank. Okay, so there's no way, no air coming out of there. You're gonna wanna grab a small drill bit and pop open a hole, being careful not to puncture through the back of the nipple. Adding a little piece of tape as a visual stopper can be helpful. Seems pretty good. With the passageway open, you can attach the external fuel line that you'll run to your diesel pump that came with your heater. You'll find that they provide you with a rubber fitting that goes from a quarter to about a sixteenth inch fuel line so you can attach directly to the nipple with a little force and then step down to that smaller size. That ain't going nowhere. I'm gonna put this back in. Yeah, that seems like an unobstructed place. Get this line back in there, and then work this float back in. Okay, like so. And this was facing forward. We routed ours to the back of the tank since that's where our heater was gonna be located, but you can route yours toward wherever you located your heater. Just make sure when you're done, you put everything back the way you found it, and before you know it, the tank will be back into place and you'll be good to go. Yeah, didn't get that dirty. We then went and attached our fuel pump. The key things to keep in mind are the lengths of your fuel lines. The blue line coming from your fuel tank can't be more than six feet or two meters. And the clear line running from the pump to your heater can't be more than 18 feet or six meters. You'll also want to angle the pump between 15 and 35 degrees in order to keep air from getting trapped in the lines. If necessary, you can angle the pump greater than 35 degrees, but you should never angle it less than 15. Finally, the line coming off the pump to the heater should be at a continuous upward angle, again, to keep air from being trapped in the lines. We attached ours with the provided rubber boot hanging a little off the metal framework so there wouldn't be any vibrations. I wanted to go quickly, so I just gave up and used one of the self-tappers that were provided. You can see it's at a little more than a 15 degree angle. This is gonna be our auxiliary fuel line and uh, feed it in right there. And then here is going to be our main line feeding into the heater itself. Hose the hose, I'm tightening it down. But we're not touching here, that's good. Ready? And I also used some quarter inch split loom that I had to buy on my own just as an extra protector for the lines. We're good there. Make sure to keep a little bit of it in your mouth as you cut it. What's the purpose of that? To feel if you got the cut right. Can you, you can feel the vibrations? Yeah, I did it right. Uh, I'm going to tighten them now. So see, this is kind of a little bent. We're gonna just take a zip tie and make sure it stays like that. 
And yes, we mounted it very close to the exhaust. They're not touching. There's probably about an inch and a half between the two of them. But we've ran this now for several hours and I've gone and checked and there's no sign of melting. But if we do run into any issues, I'll just go ahead and reroute the exhaust. Now you might be thinking, wait a minute, didn't he list three things that were gonna be mounted on the exterior of the van? That's because I did. We've gone through and shown how we've mounted the heater and how we mounted the diesel pump, but we never got into how to mount the little water pump that comes with the kit. And that's because after reaching out to several people, we decided that it'd be best to mount it within the interior of the van. The pump can be mounted to the exterior or even directly to the heater itself, but since we were working in such a tight space and we couldn't find a good location to have it completely like protected from debris, we figured the inside would be a safer route. Now it does mean it's gonna be a little louder while it's running on the inside of the van compared to being mounted outside, but you'll see later on in the video, it's really not that bad. Okay, let's get back to it. All right, so with all of our external components in place, it was time to hop back inside and start putting everything together. But there was one last thing we needed to do. So both the heater and the diesel pump have electrical connections. So we needed to feed some wires from the interior of the van out which meant I had to cut another hole. I also knew we were gonna have to put some type of like purge or drainage line. So if we needed to troubleshoot any issues with the system, we could then drain it and work on it. Now the connections on the harness, the main connection that goes to the heater has a very large plastic end to it. And I could have taken that off and then like reconnected it all. But instead of doing that, I ended up using a two and a quarter inch hole saw through the floor so it could all just fit. So that's a big hole. I then used an electrical boot to like seal all that up later on, but I can show that in a bit. All right, so now with all of our holes cut and lines running into the van, it was time to mock up our system. The first thing we needed to do was put some 90s on our PEX lines. Point of no return. Just using the 90 degree assists was a little awkward and they were not facing each other properly. So we ended up taking those off, cutting the lines and adding little 90 degree brass fittings. And then go, we're good. And go, go. All right, we have our 90s. Then it was time to pop some holes in our subfloor. We ended up having to cut five holes. So this is our electrical pass through. These are our two glycol lines, oh. little nipples. These are our heater PEX lines. Five holes, three hole saws. Inch and three eighths. As you can tell, we set the holes through our floor Perfectly even. <laughs> God! What? <laughs> Can you see them? Yes, they look demonic. Then we decided to mock up our bench seat since that's where all of our plumbing and hydronic system would be located. We'll be doing all of our vans framing with aluminum extrusion, but it turns out you have to wait about a year for it to show up. <laughs> so we ended up using two by twos to mock everything up. Pretty solid. Temporary. <laughs> Okay, so here's our game plan for our system. We had an expansion tank, a water pump, a heater, a heat exchanger, an air matrix, and our heated floor system that all needed to be connected together. You can either go with a single pipe system or a double pipe system. A single pipe system creates a giant loop with one item leading into the next. For example, for our system, it would go to the expansion tank then the pump, the heater, the heat exchanger, the air matrix, the heated floor, and then all the way back to the expansion tank, creating a loop. This is a very simple and clean setup that's great for a short loop system. The downside is that the heat dissipates the further down the system it goes, meaning our heat exchanger would be receiving priority, which makes sense because you're gonna be needing hot water throughout the year. But then as it moves down the line and eventually meets the end of your radiant floor, the heat will be greatly reduced or lost. Now there are workarounds for this using separate loops, shutoff valves, and balance valves, but we just decided to go with the two pipe system. So in this system, instead of having one main line, you've got two. One sending hot fluid to all the components and one return bringing it back to the heater. Then each component connects to both loops. One coming from the main heating line and one tying back into the return line, thus creating a separate loop for each of the components, allowing equal distribution of the heat. Then we also wanted to add a bypass to our heated flooring since we wouldn't be needing it during the warmer months. 
thus not needing a bunch of fluid running through the floor at all times. We did this by adding two three-way valves, one on the main and one on the return, that when turned would bypass the fluid from getting to the floor and send it directly back to the expansion tank and through the system. We didn't really see the need to add a shutoff valve to the air matrix or the heat exchanger since we'd be needing hot water from the heat exchanger year round and the runs to the air matrix were so short that even if it's turned off and we're not using it, we wouldn't really be losing any heat by allowing the glycol to continue running through it. We also needed a purge or drainage line. So I snagged a purge tee that would tie directly into the return line of our system. The last main thing that I want to point out is the expansion tank. The one that comes with the kit is pretty big, measuring around 8.5 wide by 12 inches tall if you include those bottom connections. And it needs to be at the highest point in your system in order for the air to escape your lines. Also, the way you connect your system to the tank depends on whether you're running a single pipe system or a double pipe system. In a single line, the diagram shows you having to connect to two locations, creating an in and an out, so you'd have to pop open one of the nipples since only one is open on the tank that they send you. Now if you run a two pipe system, like us, you can leave the tank as is and just connect to a single udder. We were told that this was the most efficient way to run the expansion tank in a double line system. Why? We have no idea. We've asked several people and we can't get a clear answer. So maybe if one of you know, go ahead and leave it in the comments. Okay, so with a game plan in place, we got to work and after a few configurations, we ended up with this. Okay, so this is our expansion tank. We fill the glycol in here. The pump takes it down and pulls it in this direction, down under to the heater. It heats up in the heater and it comes back up through this line um, and then it can flow into the heat exchanger and keep going towards the back, which leads it to the air matrix straight back. This is our purge valve. Right now it's open yeah. because we just purged the system. To close it, we divert the fluid to go straight back and head to our heated floor system. It's gonna zigzag through the heated floor system and return and then come back through our three quarter inch or 20 millimeter return line here where it will merge with the return line from the air matrix here, continue on, merge with the return line from the heat exchanger here, continue on back down through the pump. If you wanna bypass our heated floor, you change these valves to face this way, and then it will just go that way. And that's that. Real quick, I wanna point out a few details that we just glazed over. First, you're gonna notice that we're using two different sized pipes, one being 20 millimeter or three quarter, and the other being 16 millimeter or five eighths, and both of those come with the kit. Now, our main two lines are both three quarters, including the line coming from the header tank and then going into the pump, then down into the heater, back up, and into the heat exchanger. And you'll notice the heat exchanger comes with two fittings, one being a three quarter barb fitting and the other being a five eighths. That's because the inline of the the heat exchanger is larger and then the outline is the 5 8 so just make sure when you're putting on the fittings you're putting the 3 quarter one on the side that has the little mixer on it and then on the opposite side it's the 5 8 fitting and don't forget to add thread tape to all the threaded fittings you have in your system then you'll notice the lines coming to and from the air matrix are both 5 8 so we have three 5 8 lines running in our system. In total, our system has two standard three quarter brass barbed tees, and then we have three three quarter to 5 8 brass barbed tees, and a little three quarter barbed elbow. And we had to buy all those separately since they didn't come with the kit. You really won't have to worry about that if you go with a single pipe system. This is mainly due to the fact we went with the double. And then there were a bunch of other fittings we had to get that were three quarter threaded to barb that would connect to our purge valve as well as the two three way valves we did for our bypass. If you're curious, on how the bypass was set up. It's probably not the smallest and most efficient bypass out there. And if you guys know of one that's not like extremely expensive, please leave it in the comments. And I will point out that the first three-way valves that we bought from Amazon were terrible. They even leaked out of the top where the lever is, which I could not get to stop leaking. So we ended up swapping them out for better fittings. And I would say if you have to buy fittings, don't 
order them on Amazon. I would recommend going to a local dedicated plumbing store. That way they know exactly what you need and they have the proper stuff. And if you need to do any step downs or anything like that, they'll be able to help you out and they're very knowledgeable. It's pretty frustrating how much money we spent on all these fittings and then had them get here and then have them not work. So with that being said, this is how our new little bypass is laid out. We have two three-quarter three-way valves, each having two three-quarter threaded to barb fittings in them for our main and return lines and then the bypass line. Then in order to get to our PEX lines, we had to add a three-quarter to half-inch step-down fitting, which then connected to a half-inch PEX elbow. For the example, you'll notice that those were just like straight PEX fittings. In our actual bypass, they're elbows. The last thing I'll point out is how we roughly mounted our heat exchanger and our air matrix into place. For the heat exchanger, all we did was split some tubing to serve as a barrier between the wood and hanger strapping. Then I just screwed it down into the frame. We'll be doing this differently once our aluminum extrusion gets here. Then for the air matrix, there are two holes that I sent large screws down through to attach to the framing. I also use these little rubber washers to keep the screws from cracking the plastic. Again, this is gonna be a bit different once we get our extrusion. The last little note I'll make is that if you're struggling with getting your tubing on any of the barbed fittings, you could boil some water, throw the tube in there, let it sit for a little while, and then go and try and put it on. It makes it a lot easier. Let's go right on. See that? That fitting is fitting. And I guess I'll also point out that the pump in your system is directional. So make sure that you have your header tank, which then leads into your pump, which the fluid will be pulled in and then pushed down through the side, which should go straight into your heater. And then that'll heat it up and send it through your system. So with our system finally set up, it was time to wire it all together. Now, if you don't have the same system as us, this might not be super helpful and you can skip to the next section where we test it out. But if you end up getting a Calori Air Matrix or a Wobasto controller, it might be helpful toward the end. It's up to you. Okay, so the system came with a bunch of wires, with the main one being this giant harness for the heater. Luckily, you only have to use a handful of those wires. And after staring at the wiring diagram for several hours, we finally figured things out. If you can follow the provided wire diagram then great but for any of you who aren't familiar with wiring diagrams we're gonna try and dumb it down for you a little bit so in your system you'll need to power the heater itself along with the diesel fuel pump and the water or glycol pump you'll also need to wire in a control unit of your choice we went with the easy start timer in order to turn your system on and off we also have the added high altitude kit which allows our system to operate above 10,000 feet but for most of you this won't be necessary so we'll show you how to wire your system without it the wiring harness that comes along with the system has a lot of connections, some of which you won't use. So let's start with the largest connection, the heater, and work our way through it. The heater itself has a large 10-pin connector attached, which can connect directly to the wiring harness. You'll notice two empty terminals in the harness connector, which receives the water pump wiring. Locate the pump harness, which has two loose wires, violet and brown, on one end and a black quick connect on the other. Feed the loose purple wire into the terminal 8 of the main harness connector and the brown wire into terminal 9. You'll either need a special tool or you can force it with a tiny flathead. Now you have all 10 terminals filled. The black quick connect on the side of the violet and brown harness attaches directly to the water or glycol pump. Next, we'll connect the diesel pump, which also comes with its own wiring harness. One end of the harness has a black quick connect and the other has two loose wires, a brown, green, and a green. The kit comes with a second black quick connector that you'll need to insert the loose wires into. On the main heater wiring harness, locate a similar looking black quick connect end fed by a brown, green, and green wire. This attaches to either end of the diesel pump harness with the opposing end connecting directly to the diesel fuel pump. Now you're all set to connect the 10 pin connection on the main harness to the heater's 10 pin. With the heater and the two pumps all wired, it's time to focus on your control unit. For us, our high altitude kit is installed between our heater harness and the easy start timer. But for most people, your control unit is going to connect directly to your heater harness using the provided bush housing connectors. We're going to explain how to wire the easy start timer directly to your harness first, and then how to include the high altitude kit later for those of you who it pertains to. So the easy start timer comes with 10 wires that insert into the provided 10 terminal housing connectors. Connector. The connector has two bush housings, a female and a male end. Follow the wiring diagram to insert each of the 10 easy start wires into the correct terminals of the female housing. So those click in there like so. From the main harness, locate the loose red, 
brown, and blue-white wires. These three wires need to be fed into the male end of the Easy Start Timer housing, but you may notice that they don't seem to fit. That's because the female connectors that come on the wiring harness are too large, and the kit provides you with the appropriate replacements. <laughs> You'll need to cut off the connectors from the main harness and replace them with the smaller female connectors that are provided. It requires a specialized crimping tool that we needed to order. Once you've added the correct connectors to the main wire harness, you can insert the red, brown, and blue-white wires into the male housing. The connector kit also comes with two small clear plastic pieces. They're actually secondary locking mechanisms for the bush housing. Insert the clear pieces into the respective slots on the side of the housing until they click. You can then insert into the female housing to complete the circuit. Now your Easy Start timer is ready to go. Keep in mind, there are three necessary wires from the timer to operate the heater. The seven remaining wires are for additional components that you can purchase, such as a secondary room temperature sensor. For most of you, the remaining seven wires will just die into the bush housing. For those of you with a high altitude kit, you'll need to install the unit in between the main harness and the control unit. This also means you'll utilize an additional wire from the main harness, the yellow wire, and replace its female connector with one of the smaller alternate connectors. Then you'll insert the yellow, red, brown, and blue-white wires from the main harness into the male housing of the four-pin connector provided with the high altitude kit. The orientation of the wires matter, so pay attention to the wiring diagram. The male housing can then be inserted into the female housing already installed on the high altitude harness. Next, you'll see four loose wires coming from the altitude harness, the same yellow, red, brown, and blue white. These loose wires connect to the male housing of the Easy Start Timer. Insert the 10 wires from the Easy Start Timer into the female housing, the same process we just described, but then attach them to the male housing of the altitude unit. Now you are good to go. Okay, so finally, let's identify the remaining wires and components of the main harness. The loose blue wire is used to connect to an auxiliary heater switch, which we don't have in our system. So we're just gonna insulate and tie that off, in addition to a black red wire. You'll also notice small brown and black wires with clear connectors near the battery connections. These are used to tie in a fan relay if you're wiring an air matrix directly to your heater. We decided to wire our air matrix independently, so we're also tying these off. Next, you'll see a small closed circuit with a blue-white wire on one side of the housing and a red, brown, and blue-white wire on the opposite side. This is a diagnostic tester that can be disconnected and attached to an adapter in order to run diagnostics on your unit. The harness also has an inline fuse for the heater and both pumps, so you can connect directly to your 12-volt power source. Lastly, you're ready to connect your harness to your battery using the negative brown wire and the positive red wire. And that's it. You can power on your control unit. Now onto powering your Calori blower and Webasto controller. The kit comes with a PWM, which regulates the power feeding to the air matrix, depending on the fan speed that's set by the Webasto controller. The kit comes with a harness, which has all sorts of connections that we disassembled, because for this application, they're mostly all unnecessary. The air matrix connects to the PWM via a negative and positive, which for us was the black and orange wires from the matrix. We cut the quick connect off, added the provided connectors, and attached them to the PWM via a provided housing. Make sure the wires from the matrix to the PWM do not exceed 4 inches or 10 centimeters. Okay, so there's our main connection. As you can see, we have a ton of room to mount this wherever we'd like. I think there's good. Then you'll need to power the PWM, which will in turn power the air matrix. The harness comes with one positive and one negative battery connector, each split into two loose ends. You'll need to run one pair of positive and negative wires to the PWM and one to the Webasto controller to provide each with power. Finally, you'll need to run a wire from the Webasto controller to the PWM, which we recycled a yellow wire from the harness for. Lastly, connect the provided temperature sensor to the Webasto controller using the two-pin housing. Like so. So, this is what we did. Coming from the battery here, you have, from the harness, this, which is two main positive connections, the 14 gauge goes to a 10 amp fuse, the 16 goes to a 7.5. So out of this come those two wires. The thicker wire runs into the PWM guy, and then you're gonna connect your positive and negative coming from your blower, which was black and orange for us. And then this yellow guy is what goes all the way over to your Webasto controller. It's the communication link. Then your thin wire 
the 7.5 amp fuse. Again, there's a positive and a negative through the harness and it runs to here. Positive and negative. And then again, the yellow connection. These are little connections for the sensor, this temperature sensor. The only big thing is you have to put on the connectors to fit to the provided uh, like four prong connect here, which is those like Molex connectors, which is a pain because they're very tiny. And then they have those like slide in sleeve connectors, but theirs have little clicking mechanisms on the side of them so that they go into these plastic housings to hold it all into place. Okay, that's connected. We also have a heat mister thermostat, but we're not hooking that up yet. You're gonna have to stay tuned for when we actually put our whole system together for when we actually hook a thermostat to it. All right, so with everything wired up, it was time to add our glycol mixture. We ended up grabbing a product called Cryotech 100, which was a pre-mixed red colored propylene glycol that tasted like gross cherry cough syrup. I hate cherry cough syrup but it's not gonna kill you. Make sure to get propylene since it's non-toxic. And since it was pre-mixed, we really didn't have to dilute it too much. On the container, it said that to get down to temps to negative 20, you would need to have a mixture of one to three. One part water, three parts cryotech. And since it came in a one gallon container, we took three quarts of the cryotech and then took one quart of water and mixed them together. With that, we were able to pour it directly into our system. So after filling it up, running the pump, driving around a little bit to purge all of the air out of our system, we used about a gallon and a half of fluid to fill it up. And with that, we were ready to run our system. And we will point out that our first go around, we had a few leaks and we couldn't get the fluid to feed into the system. And we fixed that problem by raising our expansion tank by about two inches. So the bottom of the udder sits about six inches off the ground now. Yeah, I think we tried to do it where it was the bottom of the tank, but it was really based off of the bottom of the udder. You know, we didn't have that high enough. And since we had to lift the expansion tank higher and it's supposed to sit under our bench, we're in the market for a smaller tank. Yeah, we did see that on Heatso, they do make a smaller tank, but it's like $190. We really don't want to spend that much on a piece of plastic. So if you've got something that's a little, I don't know, more budget friendly, let us know. And then to fix our leaks, we had to go get ourselves better fittings that had thicker barbs. And then you've got these guys which have a longer stem on them. And then you really gotta work those in and that, those are definitely not going anywhere. And then we got better hose clamps and we even went and got some like better uh, thread tape. And now we're good to go. Now, since we don't have our plumbing or our electrical set up, we weren't able to test like the hot water function of the whole system. And we haven't left it running for like eight hours overnight, like we plan on doing when we sleep in here, but we were able to get some heat and noise readings for you guys. We started out by finding out if the two pipe system was working like it's set. So we took a temperature reading of the inlet of the heat exchanger. 115. As well as the inlet of our air matrix. Yeah, 115-ish. 111 and the inlet of our heated floor system again wow, 115 ish and it seems as though the two pipe system is actually doing what it's supposed to we also got a feel for the air matrix and the kind of heat that it would be putting out okay so i've set it to about medium so directly in it it's still the same temperatures that we're reading out of the lines i mean it feels pretty good it's nothing crazy. We were worried it might burn the person's ankles, whoever's like sitting on this bench seat here, but it's not like, I don't know, it's not like lava hot. And maybe it's supposed to be, we don't really know. I don't know if anyone out there who has one of these systems is watching this, but if yours is like stupid hot, let us know. And as far as noise goes, the pump after the initial startup isn't too loud. I'm like right on it. About 58 decibels. Like a standard conversation, like I'm doing right now, is about 60 decibels. But then, you gotta imagine, this is gonna be covered up with the cushion, it's gonna be your little couch bench seat. Um, so if I was like up here, about 44 decibels. So it's a bit quieter. Now the blower is super loud. I'll set it at the lowest setting, and then I'll set it at the highest setting, and I'll even stay away from it, okay? 53.2, not bad. Still below conversation, we're not uncomfortable. Highest setting. It's like a jet. 73.3, noise above 70 decibels over a prolonged period of time may cause hearing damage. <laughs> but it's hot. Then, 
Finally, we ran an experiment on our heated floor system. All right, so now that our system's all set up, we are gonna do a little experiment. So if you watched our previous video where we showed you our whole little heated floor setup, you'll know that we use these heat transfer plates to hold everything down in hopes of using it as like a dispersion, a heat dispersion to make it so it's not just like heated lines you could feel throughout. Well, when we did our first test with the system for that video, I took a temperature gun and I noticed that on the corners, I was getting a warmer reading than in the centers. And maybe we didn't run it long enough to like really have those plates work, but in a house, typically these plates are sat the opposite direction and they attach directly to the underside of your subfloor. We have them upside down for us. And our idea was that if we set it this way, it'd hold our pecs down and then the reflectix would take whatever heat is being pulled down and send it back up. So what I'm gonna do, just to see is leave it how it is underneath all of these parts of the floor where I'm at currently. And then on this two part section, I'm going to pull it off. And then we've got two nakeds and then we've got two plates flipped the proper way. And uh, we will see if this helps. Just by touch, I can't really tell a huge difference. Where I'm at right now, it's all the same. Where we have the heat transfer plates, the original positioning taped down to the Reflectix. Then this is the naked area. And then by Julie's feet here are where we flipped them. So if I get a quick reading, we're looking at like 60, 65 in this area. And then if I'm looking over here, same, 66. That's naked? Yeah. And then the upside downs, same, 63. So our experiment has proven nothing. That's a bummer. If you point at the back, it's 30 degrees. It's currently 22 degrees, which is like 23 degrees colder than it was when we first did this. My guess is like it's a lot colder out, so there's a lot more competition coming up and down from the floor. And so it's not as warm as it was when it was like 40 degrees out. I just expected there to be a stark difference between them, but they're all landing them between 60 and 65. So maybe it is, maybe it's like really important to have super tight lines. That could be the big, the big difference. Having a foot apart might have uh, been too much for such a small spot that gets so cold. Maybe you gotta stay down to like six inches. It's still gonna be better than nothing, right? It's not 35 on the floor. It's right. 65. Yes. Take no, our feet won't be enough. cold. Yeah, standing <laughs> on the floor, but they're not gonna be burning. Hey, come here a second. Oh, is there something, something in your teeth? teeth? Is, is something, it still there? Is there something stuck in your teeth? We hit 30K. Thanks for all the new people who are following along with the channel. I'm seeing tons of your suggestions and comments. There's a lot we could have done differently, but we're learning as we go. And sure, we could have consulted a professional before we did this, but I probably wouldn't have believed them no matter what they told me. I personally have to learn by doing. Julie, on I the other hand, is paranoid. I have to learn by doing it like three or four times. <laughs> like, we'll wait hours and hours to make sure that the air matrix has the correct direction of flow before we connect. It. Okay, <laughs> if anyone out there has a caloric air matrix, does it matter which is the return and which is the inlet? Yeah, top or bottom? Is the hot water coming in the top or is it coming in the bottom? Mm -hmm. Does it matter? We got a debate here going on. I think it does. So we're just gonna see how this one pans out. And then on the next one, we can make improvements. So is life. And just so you know, we do plan on doing a full review of the system once we actually get to put it to the test. That way I can tell you how much power it draws, how much diesel it blows through, and how well it actually heats. All right, so we know that was a long one, but we wanna thank all of you that managed to make it through. We put a lot of work and effort into this channel, and uh, we're actually kind of excited to see that YouTube pushed our last video and brought some new eyes to the channel. And we appreciate those of you who've stuck around and subscribed to follow along. And if you guys want to help even more, you can always jump on the Patreon or give a little donation to the PayPal link and all that stuff's linked in the description. And with that, thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs> Have you noticed that uh, help and support at any 
place that you try to buy products from is terrible. Non-existent. <laughs> it's non-existent. We were just watching uh, Aziz Ansari's like new stand-up and he mentions it and it was just like, yeah, you're spot on. Have you guys had that same experience? Ah. Oh! Whoa. 